so in these uh, models, uh, yeah. uh, how many data? No, just how many data points are there, and how many tuning parameters are they? Oh, I'm, God. I mean, is that a simple question, or, or data points, uh, are there? are thirty vertical levels at least, and the resolution may be two and a half by five degree grid or five by five degree grid. It's a huge number of data points. It's more than a hundred thousand points. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a jillion. And you should answer that question. Uh, um, and what was the second question? Oh, God. There's a paper by uh, uh, Gavin Schmidt. Have you seen that one on, on model tuning? I, I thought that there were just about three or four. Uh, there are dozens. You, you can get any answer you want. And remember, as Hordan said, Hordan, the Hordan paper was written by 14 different climate modeling groups, by the way. So that's those people who wrote that paper, the heads of all those groups, had to agree with the term anticipated acceptable range. So those models, there, there are an incredible number of parameters to make sure that it stays within the anticipated acceptable range. I'll get to you in a second. I've got one more question. If you don't believe that, go back and find the Vusen article in November 2016 Science Magazine because um, there, in getting the models ready for CMIP-5, each group has to submit what they call a frozen code model. Mm -hmm. And the Max Planck Institute uh, in Germany, they had theirs ready to go. The head modeler there, Ernst Reckner, was indisposed and couldn't work on it. And so it was left to the senior other people and the postdocs and all that to get this model off to the U.S. government so it could go in the next, the next uh, IPCC report. And it was a darn good model, and it had seven degrees of warming in it. And if you read the article, they actually say, we had to get that number down. So this isn't science. It's not. Sorry. So, so that, that seven degrees of warming, it's actually some extra data that you're pointing, putting in to, to fit. You're going to make the model. What they, what they did is they changed, they changed the way that heat diffused into the ocean, and uh, there were some cloud parameters that were changed, right? That was proven wrong, too. Yeah. Oh, well. Uh, but, but on it goes. Uh, Dr. Bloom from Slack. Uh, how does the Russian model do on the ground data? It does quite well. It's not great, but it's certainly better than but better than what you have here. Uh, how do you should? I would prefer a, a different flavor of that question. How does the Russian model do what it does? The heat capacity of its ocean is twice what it is in all the other models. So it takes more of a change in joules to move the temperature of the ocean. It takes twice as many joules to move the temperature of the ocean the same amount. Now, why did that, why was that done? I don't know. Do you, do you know Volodin? No, I have no, but I, have, I don't know what they did to it. Because we don't know it. Because it's deep. Nobody's been there. Uh, it's <laughs> well, not really. I mean, as, as he says, it's something that um, uh, you have a range. So when you have a range, you can use the lower range and get a, a lower result. But it's very interesting that the study that uh, this uh, s slowdown of global warming around 2000 to 2016 um, there was a paper in Nature that attributed to that the oceans absorb more of the heat that is generated, was generated in the 80s and 90s. It was proven that that was fabricated. And it was actually removed by nature. Yeah, yeah that was... Uh, that was you a, know that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I remember that one. Oh, Raswami? I don't remember the title. I think Raswami... <coughs> look it up, just... Uh, Nature it, withdraws it was retract, ocean heat it paper. It retracted by nature itself, not by the authors. The proponents of the uh, climate change and getting warmer also think... It is getting warmer. But yeah. They make the point that this is affecting the oceans with the increase in the, the, uh, I mean the acidity, which is affecting the life of them. What do you have to think about that? The acidity of the ocean varies so much 
in, in places with complex biological communities uh, that I, I don't put much stock in that. I mean, it's kind of like acid rain. Remember acid rain? Uh, that was supposed to kill the forest and all that. Well, rain is naturally acidic, and nobody could really ever find these large effects, and a lot of money was spent looking for it. Maybe it should be called half-acid rain. <laughs> but, but there is no doubt that the oceans are getting more acidic. They are. They are getting well, more getting acidic. Less basic. Yes, yes, okay, fine. <laughs> Uh, the problem with, with the ocean acidification is um, the experiments are done are, are lab experiments. You bring an organism into a lab, put, put it in an aquarium, and change the pH. Well, not quite the way things work in the real world. The, aquari the ocean is not an aquarium. And very subtle to find any real effects so far. Although I, I have predicted that, that ocean acidification may be the next global warming. Um, uh, yeah, we're way out of my field. You're in your field. The ocean does have a buffering capacity. It's a bicarbonate feedback system. If you put more carbon dioxide into the water, um, the pH can stay the same to a point. Um, unless you overload that buffering capacity in which the pH will begin to change. This is also highly dependent on, on um, water temperature, um, whereas in warmer water, the, the, carbon, the carbonate can be more bioavailable, can be pulled out of the water more easily than in um, cold and, and Arctic regions. It's one reason why you see big conches in the tropics, and if you go into the Arctic, um, where things like snails have shells that are paper thin. Tell you how much we know about the ocean. Um, you probably saw this. Basically, the the climate models, which of course are never run, are are are, are calibrated all uh, the 20th century. Um, the general consensus is they predict the ocean circulation surf, uh, would slow down. Um, that's where you get these stories of the climate of Great Britain turning into. Siberia in a paper that was written by the Defense Department, which is never ever self-serving. Uh, but um, turns out the ocean's ocean circulation is speeding up right. pretty much globally, completely opposite. Right. And yet you want to predicate your society on the forecast made by those models. That endangerment finding is based upon documentation for the future that is only based on those climate models. That's all they have. You want to do that? Go right ahead. I'm just going to make a, one point on the ocean circulation issue. Um, that the idea that you, global warming could lead to a massive cool down of places like Britain is, is really based on one major uh, ocean current, and that's the, the current... Um, it's called the Atlantic uh, conveyor belt. Um, and what happens is when the Arctic gets very cold and, and uh, fresh water freezes and turns into sea ice, that the remaining water is super salty, and that super salty water is dense and it sinks. And that's, that's the driver of this conveyor belt. And that super salty cold water from the Arctic Ocean sinks, goes, along the, goes southward along the ocean floor, and then resurfaces near the tropics. Um, and it pushes a number of currents around the world. And so that the discussion about global warming, melting the ice caps, creating large pools of water in the Arctic, that could theoretically slow down that conveyor belt because it's slowing down the push. If there's a large pools of fresh water in the Arctic, then it's not going to create the super salty, dense water that sinks. Now, if you look at the ocean globally, there's hundreds of currents. Um, some more important than others, and so you know, I just want to be, I just want to make sure we're being, we're taking in all, all available facts within, you know, within our, that are that are available to us, in our in our means to to retain them and understand them, um, but uh, you know, I I know I saw an article and I just read the headline, 
um, I'm guilty of what my own talk here. I did know, I did see that article that ocean currents are being sped up, possibly because, but that's not like let's remember that's not all currents. That that. Oh God, did you see the map in the article? It sure looked like that damn near all of them. So. See, I, I just, well, I guess that's where maybe we'll just agree to disagree. I have a hard time believing that every ocean current um, is being sped up. And I think this is that sort of what I was speaking to and, you know, select, talking about the red dots and stuff that doesn't quite make sense. I mean, are we really trying making efforts to take in all available facts and to refine our theories? I see predictive models. How much time we got? I got a good predictive model story. Okay, this one will come later. Ask me about it later. <laughs> well, I mean, by the way, this uh, driven the currents intensely increasing just came in today. So I was just showing the news. I haven't had a chance to read it. Given the more and more data that we have, it's my intuition that people are looking at this data and seeing things they've never seen before and interpret them negatively. So we have more data. We don't have a bigger perspective. I would say, oh my God, we now see this. What's this going to lead to? And as a result, a lot of projections are put onto data that beforehand we wouldn't even have cared about. I wonder why that would happen. <laughs> and do you mean by projections, you're projecting your own beliefs and your own biases and your own yeah. sympathies yeah, on them? Fears, yeah. Your own stories, yeah. whatever. So we have more data that to project stories and fears on. Did you know that the, uh, the if you take I published on this actually. If you take uh, um, a large sample of major journal articles, I'm looking at Science and Nature, uh, and seeing um, it is the it is the professed belief of my community in a friend Amicus case, Amicus brief in Mass v. EPA, that there is an equal probability that any new science finding uh, in global warming will ha will make things appear to be either worse or not as bad as we thought. That is that is their wow. statement. But there's, what's the middle way here? And so uh, that turns out to be a testable hypothesis. <laughs> and I tested it. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the assumption of equality of that was so violated, uh, it was violated with a probability of one uh, divided by uh, one followed by 17 zeros. I don't know what that is, but that's a big number. That's more than the number of stars in the universe, I think. It's more than the seconds in the lifetime of the universe. Yeah. <laughs> I guess we are out of time unless she you want to stay one. here. Okay, so last one. Just, just one, and please don't shoot the messenger because I'm an environmental lawyer. And so I actually have to, I have to operate in this world of, uh, of politics and, and public accountability in Berkeley, in Northern California. Democrat, no less. Uh, so, where, where, <laughs> so where you had me with this conversation was where the data got tossed. Data that was inconvenient got tossed. That's a very compelling legal fact. Is there any other area of science in this century or the last century where we have taken accurately measured data and just tossed it because it doesn't fit a theory? Is there a parallel? I don't know, Sam. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, I feel like those data are less likely to see the light of day, let alone see the light of day and then be thrown out. I don't know.